All right. So Bomberin has done a lot of research. She really started, uh, uh, you know, the, the the not only starting the field, but but opening up this door of really spelling out clearly. Well, what are the different types of parenting that we do? And in her research, and, and you know, people that followed her, basically outlined three different parenting types that are problematic. That do end up doing more harm than good. So we're going to review these three, and then we're going to we're going to, I want to move into well, what's this fourth type that that actually does get traction that has been shown to be really effective uh, way of looking at parenting. So the first is the neglecting type. Now I you know before before diving into this, I want to say you know as far as researchers go, they're not the most creative or tactful when it comes to naming these things. But they get to the point, you know, and, and how you label something, you know, you try and figure out what's the most accurate, truthful way of labeling it. And so it might not be so kind, but definitely gets to the point. And so the first, the first parent type is, is the neglecting type. And this kind of has three parts to it. You know, the first is that these sort of parents are very rejecting of feelings. You know, it's almost like, you know, when, when negative feelings strike, you know, kids screaming, kids wailing, or feeling some intense sad motions. You know, the parent wants it just to stop, get it to disappear as quickly as it popped up. You know, part of this is really this sort of like maybe underlying belief that, you know, the kids are irrational. You know, what does he have to worry about? I mean, after all, he's a kid. There's a, a certain sense of, say, you know, a, a lack of emotional awareness. You know, emotions are a funny thing. Like I mentioned last week that we, we kind of think of emotions as, in many ways, as, as our identities. But, you know, no, like emotions are just like seeing or hearing. They actually give us information. And so this sort of, this sort of parenting type that almost blacklists negative emotions, well, that really almost tries to erase a large part of life. The second part of this is these sorts of parents are very lax in their behavioral control of kids. And there really isn't this quality of, of, of problem solving. It's more of this, again, this avoidance, you know, like get these feelings out. These feelings are, are, are bad. Don't touch these feelings. And again, again, this this underlying belief is well, it's not, it's not that it, it, these feelings are, are going to harm the kid. They're going to harm the parent. It's almost like these. It's almost like these negative feelings are are like playing with fire. You just don't touch them. It might even develop into something more more scary for parents. That it's not just that fa that feelings are harmful. But parents, a lot of times, if they're coming from this from this way of looking at things, become terrified of what they could do, that what these feelings might make them do. Like these feelings might push them to become wrathful, to 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 hurt their kids in a way that they'll regret later. And there's something to to be said for that. I mean, we definitely don't want to. We definitely don't want to put you know, our resentment on kids. And, and that's, well, that's one reason why it's so important to, to line up our parenting consciously with forethought. Because, you know, to say that being a parent is difficult is an understatement. You know, kids are going to have meltdowns. Kids are going to have tantrums. And a part of us kind of sounds bad to, to, to say it, but a part of us really does resent when they do that. You know, the embarrassment that we suffer in public as the kids having a meltdown in the in the in the supermarket. No, I'm not giving you that lollipop. And we might be able to to keep ourselves more or less put together in those moments. But you know, give it an hour. Once we get home, sitting at our desk and our, our kid comes to us wanting to show the art they just made. Well, how, how much of that resentment we were experiencing in the supermarket is going into our response, not now, I'm working. 
is a part. And so, you know, it is something to take seriously that, well, maybe, maybe, you know, feelings do motivate us to, to have resentment. But at the same time, it's also not a strategy to avoid them either. And lastly, with this parenting type, like I said, that there's this overemphasis on avoiding feelings. Well, there's also an overemphasis on positive feelings. That's a, a should, that uh, almost like a rule that's made in the family, that you have to feel good. And if you don't, well, there's something wrong. It's, it's, it's not allowed to have anything but positive feelings. Yeah, and what and what researchers have found, you know, Gottman specifically has, has come out with some good work on this, is that it usually is the case that these sort of these sort of parents, well, you know, early on they took the role of of rescuer, you know, when they were young and almost kind of, you know, caretaker for their own parents. That early on they were taking on too much responsibility. Missing out on their own childhood. And that a lot was riding on them, keeping a stiff upper lip. You know, in that sort of situation, a kid who ends up having to be a parent to his parents. Jeez, I mean, like, you know, you don't, you don't get to show negative feelings. There's no room for that in that sort of child-parent relationship. You know, in many ways, you know, a kid like that who, you know, honestly, as a rescuer, as a caretaker, like, kids don't have those skills. The best they can do is avoid the pain and, and try and focus on the good. As far as what, what comes out in the research, you know, the outcomes of this sort of parenting strategy, what we see is, you know, ch- children generally uh, develop this, this inability to trust themselves. You know, like I said, a large part of their feelings are are blacklisted. So, well, you can't trust your feelings. They're bad. And you start end, ending up being put in this position where you really can't trust yourself fundamentally. And as try as you might, you can't avoid these negative feelings anyway. So it has this added flavor of, well, it's not just, it's not just you can't trust yourself, but there's, there, there's this feeling there's something, something wrong with you because there's all these negative feelings that keep popping up. And again, this rule in the family, this personal rule that develops where they shouldn't pop up. You can't help but feeling that you're wrong or bad. So, you know, self-esteem definitely takes a nosedive. Academic success takes a nosedive. So, uh, you know, success in school takes a nosedive. And this combination of ignoring negative feelings and not having the, the practical behavioral skills to problem solve, avoid, 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 ends up, ends up fragilizing kids. They don't have the ability to regulate their emotions. Yeah, you know, more than that, you know, not being able to regulate emotions and not having not having uh, uh, problem solving skills. Well, I mean, those are those are vital in being able to be social, to make friends, and to be able to get on in society. And so that, the research bears out, it is fundamentally harmed. And you know, I mean, like not doing well in society, not being able to regulate emotions. Well, that that goes a long way in explaining that within this group. There's a dramatic there's a dramatic deficit in being able to concentrate and pay attention. Um, the deficit is in memory and recall. So uh, all these things, you know, are really you know, the consequences of this parenting strategy. And out of all three, it happens to be the most severe. And I think what what might go into explaining that is, you know, out of all the other parenting strategy. Well, this one, like I said, is is avoidance. It's a funny thing. You know, it doesn't matter what sort of um, 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 therapeutic background you come from or your philosophy of treatment. It's psychodynamic, cognitive, behavioral. I mean, the, 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 these therapies are very different, but what's kind of cool is that the one common denominator amongst all of them, the one thing that they can all agree on, despite all the massive disagreement, is this, is this, 
is the need to be able to, to willingly face the things that cause fear and the knowledge that when we run away from the things that cause us fear, the more we're harmed. You know, in, in, in biological studies, you know, when we are confronted with things that, that cause us fear, that cause us terror, well, our body is flooded with cortisol. I mean, that stuff is toxic. I mean, that really wears away at the body. It wears away at the mind. You know, the more and more you have experiences where you're constantly being triggered, cortisol is flooding the body, the, the more easy it is to become triggered. So it actually, it, this problem is a, a problem that grows every single time that you're confronted with your fear and you run away. The more that you run away from what causes fear, the more terrifying those things become. But when you set up a person to, to willingly, to openly confront those things that cause them fear, well, what ends up happening is the, the, the human body reacts in a, in, a, in a dramatically different way. You know, the body is not flooded with cortisol. And instead of becoming fragile and in many ways broken by this repeated onslaught, people actually get tougher. They psychologically get tougher. They become braver. Fewer things bother them. It's not just becoming resistant to life, but there's this flexibility to life that develops. So it's a very, it's a very powerful it's a very powerful thing to know that whenever you avoid what causes you fear, your world dramatically gets more terrifying, just automatically. So that's the first parenting type. The second parenting type is called the authoritarian parent. Now, the three, three parts to this guy, very similar to neglecting in the sense of Emotions are something not to touch. Emotions are bad. But there's a, there's a sharpness. There's an aggression to it. It's not just that we reject emotions, but it's something to actively suppress. So these sort of parents are, are, are critical in how they dismiss emotions. Very much lacking empathy. It's like, you know, your kid shows a negative emotion. It's not just you're putting them in the room, putting them in the corner or, or ignoring them, but you're, you're making them, you're making them regret having those feelings in the way you respond. There's a, a strong emphasis on punishing the child. And usually it's these parents who are most likely to spank and, and, and I mean, we're going to get to this more in depth later on, but you know, when you go down that road, it only increases. I think it's something like, you know, 40% of parents who do spank end up at least once in their life spanking their kid in such a way where it falls square within the definition of child abuse. And it's not, it's not that the, these parents are, are bad and it's not that these parents want to hurt their kid. But what ends up happening is the more a person punishes their kids, the more they spank and use these sort of physical means. It's less that you're training the kid not to misbehave, but it's almost as though you're training yourself to use that, that particular parenting strategy. And it becomes not just your go-to, but it's something that, that, that it you know, draws you into. These parents are very power oriented. You know, they provide no explanation for what their reasoning is. They tell a kid to do something, it's you, you listen to me, you know, no questions asked. Why? Because I said so. And in response to kids' feelings, it's almost as if these parents feel like they're being manipulated. It's, 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 it's kind of like, you know, this is like a language of power sort of relationship. And that, that, that's worth touching on, you know, it's, it's not just these parent, these sort of parents that have that feeling, you know, most parents think at some point their kid is manipulative. You know, my field of work, you know, I'm always surprised with, they're not necessarily dealing with kids, but, but with, with uh, some of the clients that I see, you know, I, I, I see, uh, see people who suffer from borderline personality disorder. And when I talk to other clinicians, I'm always surprised to hear how much they believe their clients are manipulating them. The 
But what comes with kids who are not as cognitively developed, let's say, or people who are suffering from borderline personality disorder, that's not, a, that's not so obvious that's what's going on. Because to manipulate somebody, what you need to be able to do is, is to have the sophistication and, the, and the, the, the clarity of mind to be able to you know, size the person up, figure out, okay, well, what are they likely to do? You know, if I do this, they're likely to do that. If I do this, they're likely to do this. To, to have this sort of sophisticated prediction. And then to set up the situation in such a way where you're guiding them where you want them to go. Well, that's just not the case with, with these sorts of people. You know, whether it's someone who's borderline personality disorder, they're, they're so exquisitely emotionally sensitive to the world around them. Part of it's biological, and, you know, part of it is, you know, growing up in a hard, invalidating environment, where they're, the, 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 it's almost kind of like walking around without any skin. You know, things just hurt. There's a panic. There's a desperation. And when you're in that mindset, you, don't have the, you do not have the clarity of mind to be manipulative. It's like you're just trying to survive. And the same thing is, is with kids. You know, kids are not developed cognitively enough where they can, they can project themselves into, into the future like that and to, to second guess and, and to, to, to create, you know, almost like a web of if this, then that sort of thinking on how to manipulate parents. You know, they too are very responsive. They too become overwhelmed emotionally and just react. So it might look like we're being manipulated, but really it's kind of like, you know, brass tacks. Well, you know what? No one enjoys having a kid scream at them. You know, the kid's panicking and, and a part of us kind of folds under the pressure of not wanting, of not being able to tolerate that for so long. And, you know, fair enough, you know, even with parents, I'm not suggesting you just kind of sit there and let the kids scream at you. But at the very least, you know, how you look at that is pretty important. And a starting position should be more charitable than being manipulated. Well, maybe this is, maybe this is just lack of control. It's something to watch, something to see, as we're, as we're going to get in later on with, with watching behaviors. You know, it's at these points, it's at these moments, it's most important to observe as much as you can to make that behavioral map so you can start figuring out how to solve this problem. But it's not manipulation. You know, and the final part of this is, is, is a high level of rigidity. This belief that, you know, emotions are something to be controlled, that, that as, a, as, a, as the first go-to solution, is control. There isn't so much reflective thought. It's more, more responsive. You know, you broke the rule. There is a repercussion. And it's, it's you know, if you're, not gonna, if you're not gonna measure up to those rules, well, that's the cutoff to punishment. There's a, there's a lack of appreciation for context. You know, it could very much be this sort of thing. Well, you know, kids, you know, your daughter might be crying and screaming. Well, she needs your help. You know, your other kid's in trouble, but that's breaking the rules. That rigidity is found in this sort of parenting type. You know, as far as where this comes from, again, you know, Gottman outlines that a lot of times these sorts of parents grew up in a home where they too were emotionally neglected. It was a sort of this, 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 their own training, you know, what they what they got of their own parents was something along those lines of, of the only way through is through power and control. Anything else is selfish. It's a very harsh, harsh environment that gets translated into the next gen, you know, being put on the next generation. As far as the consequences go, they really are, are the same as the first that we saw with the neglecting parenting type. But again, not as severe. And again, I, th I think that, that you know, it's worth kind of noting again that while there is a, a strong level of avoidance in responding to feelings with such a, ri a rigid uh, philosophy, it's, it's, it's still not that level of avoidance we see with the neglecting type. The last of the three ineffective parenting types is the permissive type. 
this one is is on is on the other side of the spectrum here you know as far as as far as how these parents look at how to at, at their parenting you know they're looking at their kids as well, you know as almost like they have a right to the to to the freedoms and the feelings they're thinking and feeling that it's it's that it's a crime to 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 squelch their creativity and that the best thing to do is to to let kids be you know this almost this idea that that kids you know fundamentally are innocent and pure and that's something to to as much as you can leave untouched there's this this openness without limits and that comes out you know not just not just in allowing whatever thoughts and feelings a kid has, but comes out behaviorally. There's fewer limits, if any, set on what is behaviorally allowed. Not so many rules at all in the home. The, the value is to be as, as warm and as forgiving and as, as, as open, communicative, you know, sharing, sharing, sharing as much as possible. And, and this almost like, it's not, it's not like a, it's not a giving up or a, a helplessness, but it's just this sort of belief, well, well, what can you do with negative feelings? They're there. They just have to run their course. You know, often where these parents are coming from is, you know, they're reflecting on the, the childhoods they had. Growing up in one of the first two parenting types I already discussed. And what they got out of that experience is, well, I don't want to put that on my kid. I don't want to put those rules that I had to suffer through on him. So it's almost like a, a guilt or a, a, a shame that, that goes along with this parenting type of that it, it has to be. That kids must be free and must have the experiences that they're having. Because I don't want to put them through the hell I went through. And with this parenting, with this parenting type, the consequences are similar to the other two. But there's more of a there's more of a there's more of a sense of being lost, really. That the more open these parents are, the more open these kids are. Well, you know, a part of a part of having rules is giving structure to kids, does enable kids to feel fundamentally safe, that they, they have the ability to start being able to predict, well, good, there are rules and there are standards that I need to, I need to follow. And, and, and that gives assurance to kids. They know what to expect. You know, their future, their future might not be wide open spaces, but it's not something to be terrified of either. There's a, there's a calm and a, and a reassurance in knowing what to expect. So these kids are also easily emotionally dysregulated. And even though, you know, they, they might have a, a more sophisticated sense of, of being able to communicate their thoughts and feelings, because, I mean, that was nurtured, and, and there is something worthwhile in being able to have that level of, like a type of, you know, encouraging your kids to have a, a self-discovery of, of who they are, uh, you know, in a fundamental sort of way. But it's it's like there's so much room there's so much openness that well that that self-awareness never actually gets translated into being actualized so you have the same sort of um, problems socially where you know these kids really don't know how to interact with other kids they don't know how to set the proper boundaries they need to to protect themselves and also not put their intense emotions on other people so those are the three parenting strategies that that generate the the most harm and unintended harm because you know none of these parents are are just like I was saying with being manipulative you know like you know, no no parent is setting out thinking you know how what's the best way to hurt my kid you know we're all just trying to to get through as best we can and and then these these three parenting strategies very much do fall in line with you know certain personality types
So it's it, it, it's just worth kind of like, you know, holding that that thought a second because you know, we all love our kids. And while that's all that's that's a lot right there. And wanting the best for our kids. That is a lot right there. It might not be enough. And if it's enough for some of the kids, it might not be enough for all of the kids. You know, what the research has shown, this fourth parenting type, called the authoritative parenting type, has shown to be extremely effective in helping kids get on the right track and, and to avoid all those pitfalls I was listing off for you, but maximizes their potential. That the, authority, the, 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 author, the authoritative parenting type predicts success in school, predicts success in the workplace. It predicts, it predicts having a good marriage. It predicts, you know, they themselves going on to have having a close, uh, meaningful relationship with their kids. Being able to emotionally regulate themselves, to be able to catch social cues and, and to... And to be a be a, a a productive member of their community, and this sort of parenting strategy has been shown across the board in every culture to be the most effective, not just in Western cultures, but but from Japan to South America to Europe, you know, every culture. This this really seems to be the the right path. And what's kind of cool about this one is it's really taking the best from all the other different parenting strategies. That those other parenting strategies alone, you know, whether it be this high demandingness that we were seeing in the, in the, in the more aggressive parenting strategy, or, or this very high acceptance, acceptance that we were seeing with the permissive strategy, well, alone, well, those are very damaging. But it's, almost kind of a paradox that when you put them together, that's what maximizes parenting. That's what maximizes success with your kids. That we are having strong demands and there are rules and we, and we do expect our kids to live up to, to certain standards in the home and specific standards that they're, they're aware of. And what comes out is well, when that's, when that's balanced, with high acceptance and a responsiveness to feelings. Not trying to push them away, not trying to run away from them. Well, we get the best that that order has to offer. You know, that there, there is structure, there is predictability, there are consequences to actions. That that helps mold kids in being able to, to know that well, they can, they can have standards put on them and they can have expectations to live up to and they can live up to them. Making life more predictable. I mean, a part of this is the more predictable you can make things in the home, the easier it is that kids end up learning, oh, well, when I do this, good things happen. When I do that, bad things happen. And they can, they can take it's almost like these sort of like general rules of life and they can they can take that in their in into their adulthood. You know, one 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 way of looking at being a parent is well it's almost like we're society's representative, except we're a lot nicer than society's gonna be. And that sure kids do make mistakes. And you know, being parents, loving our kids, we're we're not we're not gonna we're not going to try and needlessly make our kids suffer over the state over the mistakes they're going to make, but we we do have to put into place this expectation. Well, there are expectations. Other people are going to want, not that they want something out of you, but like they kind of do want something out of you. They they want you to be able to participate and play nicely. They do expect you to follow the rules. And so this sort of high demand gives over that skill to kids. There are behaviors that are expected and there are behaviors you better not do. So that's one part of this. And like I said, the other part of this is this high responsiveness to feelings, this, per, per, this permissiveness to whatever you feel. 
that that we as parents are open and warm and inviting to our kids and how they feel. That we can support them in the tough emotions they're having and also support them and celebrate the, the positive emotions they're having. And this, this sort of this permissiveness, this responsiveness to our kids' emotions, well, this is really where we're able to develop them as individuals. Kind of getting back to the idea last week of, you know, kids need to be able to be good members of the group, but they also have to be individuals as well and know when to, to step out of the group and, and, and make a stand for the, the values that we hope they'll take on, that we pass on to them. And it's this balance between the two. Well, the way to do that is, is through having demands. They do figure out how to get on with society, but, but by being permissive and being open to exploring their emotional world, that enables them to figure out who they are who they are as individuals, and what they have to offer uniquely to the rest of the world. And it's not, it's not as though these two things are two separate skills, two separate uh, modes of being, but they really have to go together. It's that every feeling is okay, and not every behavior is okay, and they go hand in hand. And we do have to lay down the law. That there, that again, we're going to get into how to effectively um, set limits and 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 get into punishing. And there, there are there are going to be times where we have to lay down the law. But unlike the other parenting types, it's not coercive. It's not with brute force. And that we do set rules, but those rules are negotiable. There's something there's something to these rules that they have to have a certain level of flexibility. And we invite discussion with our kids. And I mean, that's even kind of cool because it's not, it's not, it, a lot of parents kind of think about this as, you know, like almost like they're encouraging their kids to, to not listen or be chutzpah dick. And, and done poorly, you might actually get that, that outcome. But what we're shooting for is, is almost kind of like inviting kids to be a partner in the process of following these rules. It's almost like inviting them into the lab, figuring out, well, how do rules work and, and how to negotiate the different wants and desires both parties have. Well, that's a really good skill to have in, in life, of being able to negotiate. You want your kids to be able to do that. And, you know, if, you, if, if, if we have the high expectations we do and the high openness to their feelings, well, they, they never really end up turning into these chutzpahdik monsters we're worried about. And they're able to take those skills and mix it with being able to negotiate tough situations. Well, th those sorts of kids become amazing in society. You know, that's the sort of person you want on your team. That's the sort of person you want, you want to marry. Someone who can compromise. So kind of, kind of put another way fitting this into the skills we're going to be learning, you know, with this sort of parenting type, this sort of parenting philosophy, we want high nurturance. And this is going to be the emotion coaching aspect of the course, where we are supportive and accepting. We are responsive and we are warm to, to, to the feelings our kids are having, no matter how terrible they might be. And in a certain way, it's also kind of this sort of openness to feeling. We're also showing our kids Tough emotions aren't going to eat you alive. Again, they're not something to be feared. There's something that, well, once, you, once they're not something that, that's to be feared, well, you can start being a little curious about it. There's something to learn from those tough emotions, and there definitely is. You know, anger, in many ways, its function is to tell you there's an injustice in the world. And you need to be able to, to recognize anger early on so that it doesn't consume you and turn into disgust. Which that, and that's, that's, a, that's, that's, a, that's a tough emotion to, to put on somebody. That we're able to recognize anger early on, to see the injustice, to see what needs to be fixed, what's in front of you, and then to do it. That's an important piece of information. Or being sad. You know, its function is to tell you, hey, well, you know, like there's, you lost something. 
you're missing something. To take an accounting of, well, how did you lose it? And to tread carefully because, well, you know, being sad, you kind of have this feeling of not wanting to push forward in life. Well, and I'm not talking about being depressed, but, you know, it, it is, you know, sadness does kind of pump the brakes a little bit. Uh, being sad does pump the brakes a little bit. Having the person take stock of what, what just occurred. And even think about, well, okay, there was a loss. Maybe... Maybe there's another way of being or there's something else that the kid can do to replace that loss. To take the time to be self-reflective in the way that sadness kind of asks us to be. So we don't want to get rid of those emotions. We want those emotions to be there because they give something to life. They enrich life. The, the, the second part to this, this, again, this high demand, well, that's the, that's the regulation of behavior, what we're going to be getting into with the parent management training part of this course. You know, that, that there are reasonable expectations that, that, that do need to be put on kids, and, and we are going to be, as parents, we are going to be willing to use force to set those standards and make sure that the kids do measure up, but in a way that we're not tyrants in a way that we're not punishing in this almost like vengeful sort of way, but being able to keep an eye on, on how rules, how restrictions have this sort of paradoxical result of bringing forth creativity and bringing forth you know, personal greatness. And by using these two different skills, that we're replacing manipulation. We're replacing this permissiveness. Tempering it, and maybe is a better way of thinking about it. So the kids can self-actualize. But they have the skills to do that.